Um, hey, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm here today with another fellow MVP, dual MVP actually, and uh, Microsoft Regional Director, Rainer. Hey, hello. Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me. Glad to be on your show. So people that don't know you, uh, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? My name is Rainer Stropik. Um, I live in Austria, in Europe. I have a small company here, which is called Software Architects, and I code for a living. That is what I do. That is what I'm passionate about. I love writing code. I always say every day where I can write code is a really good day. Unfortunately, there are a lot of days where I can't write code. Uh, but still, yes, this is what I'm passionate about. I have been writing code um, that is somehow related to cloud computing for uh, over 10 years now. So I started with Azure with the very, very first technical previews. So that is essentially what I do, building solutions in the cloud based on uh, various technology like Node.js, uh, C Sharp, .NET, Go, and many other technologies. Well, that's interesting. So, so I, like for, I'm assuming for clients, or are you building products? Are you like, a, a, like kind of an ISV type solutions where you're building things and reselling them? But what kinds of solutions are you building? Oh, both. Uh, when we started our current company, we is my, my wife. She's a programmer too. She's an awesome UI developer. And I, we, we started a previous company together. And approximately 12 years ago, we thought we would like to do something else because previously we were always working in the consulting space and we wanted to feel how it is to create a, an off-the-shelf product. And this is what we did. We sat down, we sold our shares to the previous company and we sat down two years without any customers. That was an awesome time. So we started on a green slate. <laughs> I like, I like the have to kind of chuckle as you say, it was an awesome time. Yeah, I'm sure how it was often, awesome for you. <laughs> yeah, it, it was absolutely awesome because how often do you have the chance to really build an off the shelf product with a brand new technology like Azure from the ground up where you take yourself and a small team and you take yourself two years of your life and just build something and then try to try to make a living out of that. And that is what we essentially did. So we, we sat down, we wrote a, a kind of platform. Nowadays, you would call it a low code platform. Um, and based on that low code platform, we built, uh, a, we, we call it a, dom a domain specific development platform. We, we built various uh, products. Uh, one of the products, Time Cockpit, is we, we marketed ourselves. And we also built some customer products for partners who market market this software. The common denominator about all the things we do is software as a service. So nowadays we have our own products. We have products that we build for partners and we also spend a lot of time helping customers, small, medium and large ones, to do the transition from the traditional IT, traditional licensed based software development towards software as a service on all levels. From DevOps to cultural transition to technical transition up to business models, pricing schemes and all this stuff. This is what we do. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of the story of almost every ISV out there where they, uh, it, it's, it's interesting as you go through and I'm probably thinking of, uh, you know, handful off the top of my head, but, you know, that are in the Microsoft ecosystem that were SIs, consulting companies that went and said, you know, we're doing, we're seeing patterns in our engagements with our clients. I see there's an opportunity for a product here. And so I'm going to go and build something that will speed up on our, you know, our consulting kind of a, uh, an accelerator, uh, you know, for our consulting efforts that turn into a product that they go and then start selling and they make that transition over to an ISV. And certainly it's the, with the, you know, software as a service space, it's become much easier, much less expensive, lower barriers or entry to have a product idea and for a consulting company to build something or just an expert, you know, a, a coder, an engineer that with an idea or to partner with a company uh, to come in and build that kind of IP. It's, That's it's, interesting because yeah. my experience as an entrepreneur is really very much different. Really? Uh, I, we, we, yeah, really. We have built products before 
let's say, the pre-cloud era. And yeah, we managed to do that. And it was, from a financial point of view, it was, it was rather easy. It was a quick win. It wasn't that difficult to finance. Um, but when we transitioned to software as a service, one of the things that I really became aware of when, when doing my own business is that it's super hard to make a living out of software as a service. Because if you think of... Um, well, I have to describe that. We, we build business-to-business -business software. We don't build end-customer software. So right. our customers are typically medium to large enterprises. So in the past, in the pre-software-as-a-service area, we built something. And when we had a customer, we sold licenses to the customer and we got a ton of money up front. We had that money. And well, if the customer did a wrong decision, hopefully not, we had the money. We got a little bit of money, let's say maintenance stuff in, in the upcoming years, but we had the money. So the cash flow was immediate and rather a big load of money up front and then small amounts of money for maintenance. But with software as a service, you still have to pay all the employees. You still have to pay uh, all the, uh, the, the investments that you do for, for development, for designing this stuff, but you don't get a lot of licensing up front, for instance, for our own product, we charge for a single user seven euro. That's, I don't know, eight to nine dollars, something like this per month. Mm -hmm. So when you start with, let's say, a few hundred users, that's only a very, very small amount of money that you get each month. Over time, the total customer value is really great and it's more interesting than building an IS, classical ISV product. But from a cash flow point of view, from the point of view of an entrepreneur who wants to build a company that is financed from its own cash flow, I don't want to have venture capital. That I'm, I'm a European, so <laughs> we, we don't have this venture capital uh, culture here. I have to finance it on my own. It was really hard and much harder than I thought. Well, so I don't think that there, our two statements are mutually exclusive. You're right. I, 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 so I've, I've seen the same thing. And that actually, I, I think, uh, in my experience, so I, I left Microsoft in 2009 and I mm -hmm. worked for, uh, for most of the last decade for uh, ISVs. And, uh, and so saw that struggle firsthand of moving from that on-premises model to the cloud and that licensing struggle. Microsoft struggled with that initially. I mean, every company uh, that is making that move and, and, and those companies that could weather that period uh, like you did for two years of going and building something and seeing how it works out to start building that, that business. And you see some of the ISVs that made early investments, it's just now starting to pay off. They're, 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 it, it, it's making sense because they were early and they were able to weather that, that, that time. Yep. And certainly there are vendors that are out there, ISVs that continue to develop for and support their on-prem or hybrid environments just because they can recognize, you know, greater revenue by still supporting those scenarios, even though they understand that the future is out in the cloud and that's where things are, are moving. Um, but you're right. I, I was talking about the IP creation you then made it real by talking about then making money off of what you're building and making ah, it worthwhile. I see. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. From from the point of view of an IP creation, yes, it's much easier because you don't have to deal with so many detailed problems. I mean, what Azure platform as a service, software as a service, what modern framework gives you is enormous. If I think back, I. 10, 15 years, I made a living of helping customers to install SQL Server clusters. Nowadays, <laughs> I mean, that's 30 seconds at a single line of Azure CLI or PowerShell and you're done and you have the most, most, uh, most reliable database cluster you could ever think of. And 15 years ago, I, this would have been a huge project. And if you wanted to do something like that, it wouldn't have been possible. So right. it, I, it's not just uh, standing up servers and those getting those environments going, yep. but the optimization of those environments. And Absolutely. It, you know, the system is coming back and providing yep. you details on, hey, here's how you can uh, you, you know, improve what you've deployed, yep. and yeah, it's yep. it's uh, and there are some interesting partner solutions. And I know some uh, you know, fellow RD that has created a solution which is going and provides add-on uh, you know guidance on optimizing your Azure resources, as an example. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, so what's some of the stuff that you're out there actively talking about, uh, presenting on right now? What kind of what are the, your hot topics? 
Oh, I have so many topics. Um, what are the hot topics currently? It, it changed because of the whole COVID stuff. Yeah. So uh, essentially, I canceled all my personal appearances on conference and, uh, conferences until the end of the year. That was a hard decision, but it had to be made. So I do a lot of uh, meetups and I do a lot of virtual conferences. And my talks are primarily currently focused on the whole Azure. And I would say in Azure, specifically the DevSecOps topic, that is something that is really hot now in Azure because there are currently a bunch of new services coming out, which are, on my point of view, uh, real game changers in terms of DevSecOps. And from the development side, I talk a lot about .NET because .NET 5 is around the corner, C Sharp 9 is around the corner. So I try to bring together those two things. How can we use the latest versions of .NET Core and .NET 5 and the latest language versions inside of Azure to really build, to really build interesting solutions? That's the professional side and on the let's say community side that's more the kind of technologies that i'm really passionate about for mm -hmm. the future um currently rust is the topic that i'm really very much into it uh, we are currently um uh, starting a new meetup here in my hometown uh, it is a rust meetup and we are very excited we start in august we do a monthly meetup it will be in english so it is not just for austrians if you google rust lints rust minus lints.at maybe i can give you the link and you can yeah, no, add it to the video description everybody can join we have awesome speakers from for instance microsoft in the first meetups and yeah it is a meetup where we want to uh, give all the people who are interested and curious about this brand new programming language which also starts to play a role in the microsoft ecosystem who are curious and want to learn so it's not just a deep dive for experts but it should be a meetup where also people find something interesting who are just learning so this is from the community side the thing that i'm very much passionate about Kurt. Well, that, and that, that's great. I mean, obviously, during this this uh, quarantine period, as as things are slowly opening back up, I mean, they're they're still like you. I've also canceled all of my in person for the end of this calendar year, and uh, really difficult to do. We have our we have an annual formally SharePoint Saturday and a Microsoft three sixty five Friday event, mm -hmm. which oh, it typically happens the first or second weekend in February of every year. This is going to be our eighth or ninth year, I think ninth year in a row of doing it. We're really nervous about you know, watching to see, you know, are we going to be able to do this in-person event? And we'll, we'll come up with something if that doesn't happen. But in the meantime, um, we've really bolstered the community activities. Uh, I host a lot of guest webinars for our user group. We have multiple user groups, so we do a lot of cross-promotion of activities across them. What are some of the other community things that you're involved in? Two things. Um, one is my big passion. It's working with kids. Um, I am a chairman and co-founder of the local Code Dojo, which is a programming club for kids between eight and seventeen. And I spent a lot of t I spend a lot of time organizing events, working as a mentor, setting up events. We do every single Friday. We do five to seven workshops, many many hours, many mentors, all for kids. Everything virtual. So. I love this. I really love working with kids and juniors and uh, young coders and see how they, how they playfully and, and uh, joyfully explore the beginnings of the world of software with things like Scratch and JavaScript and Python and, of course, a little bit C Sharp and so on. So um, that is really an important part of my work with the community. And the second project that I'm currently involved in, I am very happy and a little bit proud that I made it into the group of the final 18 candidates for a seat at the board of directors from the .NET Foundation. I think the .NET Foundation is a really important foundation when you work with .NET. And uh, I offered my help. And yeah, we will see. The, the election period starts tomorrow. In fact, and it will take until I think August 3rd. So I can encourage, and I would like to take the opportunity to encourage everybody to take a look at the .NET Foundation website. If you are not a member yet, please become a member. It's important. They they need the support from the community, and then you can join in in the election and vote for the next next uh, board of directors. 
Well, we'll definitely I'll provide a link to that out there. I know we'll have a little time in this this period once this is live as well. But um, yeah, so I mean, talk a little bit about you know, like what do they do? What 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 will you do if you get elected to that? So what will mm -hmm. be your role? Mm -hmm. The .NET Foundation is the foundation that supports open source project. There is a list of member project. Everybody who builds an open source project that is somehow connected to .NET can apply for a membership at the .NET Foundation. And if you become a member project, they will provide you with various support options. Um, that is from legal support to many other options. I can't. It's it's it would be too much to go into the details in this interview. Everybody but he can look up the details on the website. And the, the foundation also cares for the big open source projects like the, the C Sharp compiler, the .NET framework, and the UI frameworks, and many of the open source projects that everybody of us .NET developers love and use on a daily basis. So they coordinate and support these open source projects. And beside that, they also support and coordinate the community by supporting meetups, for instance, by coordinating speakers and content. They, they support the creation of learning content and so on. And the board of director is, is uh, voted for a limited amount of time and they are essentially the, 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 uh, the, cream, uh, the, 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 the group of people who are together deciding about where to put the emphasis on in, in the next few months. Mm -hmm. And that is what the board of director does. So it's people from the community who volunteer for dedicating a certain amount of time to take a look at these projects, to speak with the, with the community heroes, with the, with the heroes who build these open source projects, to ask them what they need, and then to target the support of the .NET Foundation into the right direction. That's essentially what the board of directors does and what the .NET Foundation is all about. Well, excellent. Well, I, you know, definitely provide a link and, and encourage people to go out and, and uh, awesome. vote Thank for you. you. Very much. Yeah, for sure. And uh, oh, there, are, there are so many great people there. So take a look at the candidates. They have videos online. Everybody stands for a certain, let's say, emphasis. My big emphasis is working with kids and, and juniors. That is what I would personally like to bring onto the table. So not just waiting for me, uh, voting for me. Just take a look at all the candidates and then decide on your own where you want .NET to go. No, and definitely, and I was going to ask you about so you, about the uh, the Children Connection. Is that a local uh, uh, group or is that a global? No. Is it you know, people can Koda get involved Dojo, with that? Dojo is yeah, absolutely, yeah, they should. Koda Dojo is a worldwide community. It started in Ireland, and nowadays I think there are more than one thousand two hundred Koda Dojos all across the globe. I think in mm -hmm. more than one hundred countries, um, Koda Dojos are volunteer-led programming clubs. So it's completely free. You must not earn money with this. It's completely free mm -hmm. and it's very, uh, very easy to join. So uh, kids should come to these clubs. They find mentors. Mentors don't teach in the classical thing. So it's not, it's not a school. It's not support for, for school related things. It's really joyfully exploring technologies. So you come with your project. If you are a kid and you are interested in technology, you can ask a mentor. If you don't have an idea, if you already have an idea, just come to the code, find like-minded kids and work on your projects together with them. And the mentors who are in our case, typically professional software developers, they are there to support you. So we listen to the projects that our, our club members do. And then we maybe, maybe offer a workshop that will give them a little bit of the base knowledge in order to build and build their project successfully. Or maybe sometimes they are struggling with some technology and then we help them overcome the problems. We have a, a huge number of pre-built exercises. Let's call it hands-on labs for children, where if a child comes and doesn't have an idea what, it sh what she or he should do, then we provide these exercises which, are, um, which, which provide sample solutions, but always give the freedom to adjust the idea, to add something to the idea. Th this is how Coda Dojos work. It's, as I said, completely volunteer driven. And I think it's amazing what the Coda Dojo Foundation has, has built over the years. You might 
maybe you might know the Coda Dojo Foundation if I tell you that they, they are together with the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So Raspberry Pi Foundation and Coda Dojo Foundation, they are one. They are one organization and all the, they, they bundle their power in order to bring, for instance, the Raspberry Pi and all the great things that you can do with it to schools and children. I, you know, I, so I, and I've heard of it just because uh, it was brought up uh, in the planning as I see you're also participate with the global to Azure Boot Camp. So I mm -hmm. help produce that here locally, uh, you know, annually. So the last two years and as well as the, uh, the Windows and the uh, now Microsoft 365 Boot Camp uh, efforts. So these are Microsoft sponsored events. And I think it was last year or two years ago. So I've done that one for three years, the, the, the formerly the Office 365 uh, Developer Boot Camp, where they, we actually gave away some Raspberry Pi. So we had a, uh, 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 you know, a couple presentations where they leveraged those and then gave those away to the, to the audiences. But we also had a local, a similar Code Camp for Kids sponsor some of our events this last year. Uh, you know, so it's, it's always great to promote those links. We'll add those to the blog post as well. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, especially in this, in this time that we're in where, uh, you know, most kids are at home, you know, give them something to do and, and learn and have fun, but also have that community aspect. I don't think that you can start too early in getting uh, uh, your modern, our kids to uh, uh, kind of plug in and understand the, the power of community and how to leverage the collective knowledge of people with shared interests through the, the sites. They understand the social aspects, but to, from a professional and, a, and, and certainly within a, you know, a, a, a personal development, uh, a learning um, forum to, to be able to plug into some of the global community on a, from around these technology areas, I think it's just, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, you know, opportunity for, for kids to, to learn from practitioners. Absolutely. And uh, for instance, uh, it, it's so important, software is so important in our world. And we, we thought a lot about how to, how to teach kids, how to make them interested in the base technologies. For instance, learning how to collaborate on a platform like GitHub and so on. Mm -hmm. If you approach children and, and young coders, like you approach professionals, by telling them, hey, that's important and you need to understand the Git protocol because it's widespread, they are immediately bored and go away. But if you give them an interesting project, a problem that they want to solve, for instance, currently our kids are, uh, the hottest thing is writing Discord bots. This is something that they all want to do. And suddenly multiple of them during the COVID crisis would like to cooperate in building a discord bot and suddenly it makes sense to teach them about git and github and collaboration and open source and suddenly we talk about licensing models because of course they all dream to build the next big startup and with that, that that is exactly what we want to do we want to kind of sneak in useful technology and knowledge without them even recognizing that they are learning something they are passionate about a certain project, they have the right context, and then they are willing to learn. And that is, I think, uh, a kind of learning that is super important. Unfortunately, I don't know about the US, but in Europe, the school system doesn't work like that at all. They still have the classical, you have to learn that and this and that, and trust me, and I am the teacher, and I tell you, and sometimes I force you, but only a few, a few schools really managed to, to motivate kids by giving them interesting projects that the kids are passionate about and then support, then support them by providing the necessary information they need to understand uh, in order to succeed with these projects. I think that is exactly the right way how we can also solve the problem, the talent crisis that we have in IT um, instead of teaching theory for computer science. It's, it's crazy thought, but um, different people have different learning styles. I know, uh -huh. it's, yep. it's, it's, it's crazy. So some, some kids do really well. And I, it's similar here in the US where you, know, you have, uh, there are some public but private and charter schools and things that I think, uh, very few public, but a lot of private and charter that support that model. And, and certainly if you're able to, you live in an area and are to able to take advantage of a program where it has 
you know, uh, uh, you know, limited number of, of students in the program. So there's a better teacher to student ratio and it has more to do with project work and reading and comprehension and, and, and taking actions than versus rote memorization of facts and taking tests. Um, and I, you know, I'm not entirely knocking that method of the memorization test taking model because there are some kids that do very well and retain that and they perform very well. That's not the way my brain works. I was very much a, a hands-on and, and I, I did well in certain subjects. It wasn't until high school where I went to an, uh, an alternate model school where I had a one-on-one -on -one tutor a couple times a week. It was able to kind of go at my own speed and accelerate it. I graduated high school in two years and uh, it crazy thing to think about. I did very well in the subjects that I was passionate about. It's funny how that works, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just, I absolutely loved uh, once I got into at the university level and go and, and take the classes that I enjoyed and follow that, that program and did very well in the ca classes I cared about. Um, not so well in some of my general education courses that I was forced to go and take. <laughs> Uh, probably would have done better as a, uh, a, a couple times, a couple companies I've worked with that have tried to get me to go into uh, programming and go down that track. And I, uh, it wasn't a fit for me at that time in my life. Uh, I'm now kind of kicking myself for, for uh, not going and doing that. But, um, you know, I've had several times where I had, because of that one-on-one -on -one where I had advisors and teachers that, you know, make recommendations based off of that, that learning style. So, um, yeah, that's just a credit to uh, teachers. And my, my mom was very aware of, you know, Christian has a very different learning style. He needs a different kind of, you know, education here and, and much more collaboration focused and conversation and going and, and, and you know, one-on-one -on -one time with, with the teachers and reading and, and paper writing and that kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, so I was, I was lucky that way. But uh, well, anyway, well, Rainer, people want to find out more about you, get in touch with you. What are the best ways to reach you? Um, I think one of the best ways to get in touch with me or um, follow me, whatever I do or recordings on YouTube is, is essentially Twitter. So I'm R Stropek uh, on Twitter um, whenever I publish something or whenever I speak somewhere and so on. I typically send some Twitter messages. Um, there is also a website that all the RDs have. It's rainastropic.me. Uh, it's a kind of, of let's say, uh, um, a kind of business card out there and and on the bottom of this page, you have all the links to my YouTube channel, to my LinkedIn profile, and so on. So, yeah, there, it, I, I am lucky because my name is not that common. So if you Google me together with something like Azure or C Sharp, you will probably find the sites. And it's not that difficult to get in touch with me. Twitter is probably the best way. And I always like to, to throw in there at the end, too, is that, look, uh, people that are MVPs uh, or RDs, in this case, both of us are both of those things. Um, we are some of the most approachable people out there. Like we are, we thrive in community. So don't be shy. Reach out to, to Rainer if you have any questions about anything that Absolutely. he's talked about today. Absolutely. Yeah. A few days ago, um, uh, a visitor at the conference sent me an email and we had email conversation up, uh, up and forth. And, and we talked about various C-sharp concepts for multiple days. And it was a lot of fun. He enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. So yeah, don't be shy. Just send us emails and get in discussion. We love that. This is why we are MVPs and RDs, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks so much for your time this, this, uh, this evening and taking some Thank time you, away from the family. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully... I'll see you sooner rather than later. I know we don't have this summit next next spring, but uh, yeah, I, I'm maybe it will be a virtual summit. Let's see. It, there there'll definitely be the virtual summit. So uh, <laughs> we'll see you online soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Chris. Bye. Bye. Have a nice. <laughs>